income producing farms. How does this work? This came across my desk and I thought this was very interesting. I said, you know what? I need to check this out. Bring this out to the audience because we hear about so many things, real estate, single family homes, multifamily homes, apartments, things like that, but income producing farms. But without further ado, as you guys and girls can already see in this description box in the topic, we have a very special guest coming from Rad Diversify, Mr. Dutch Mendenhall. He's in his Tampa Bay, Florida office today, right now. I'm in Denver, Colorado, so you guys and girls stay locked. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, my name is Prince Dykes. This is Dutch Mendenhall. How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing good, Prince. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you for uh, being on. Uh, for people who may not be that aware of you, you know, tell us a little bit about your background. How did you get into this whole real estate thing? Oh, yeah, man. So I was a, a consultant for about a decade in real estate and information marketing and real estate companies that did coaching and mentoring. And over the years, I kept writing these models and seeing these business models. And I said, hey, nobody's ever combining the maximum ability for people to learn, be trained, be developed in real estate and the investing at the same time. And so um, after a lot of our students and we opened our own brand said to me, said, hey, Dutch, um, invest with us, put your money where your mouth is, stop teaching, stop training us. Um, I said, all right. I said, let's do it. Me and my partners, we began doing it in 2015 uh, with our investors. We've built a $200 million plus portfolio uh, hand in hand with our students over the years. And we started off with residential family homes and tax deeds and liens, then grew into multifamily. And then and when the pandemic hit, we moved into income producing farms. And so I'd had a good friend for a long time who kept pushing me to invest into farmland. And I always said no. And I kind of ignored it. And he, you know, was a multi generational farmer. Um, and then the pandemic hit. And I said, hey, farms, having a farm that produces crops and produces food and has cattle on it um, sounded pretty interesting to me. And then I started to run the math and I started to analyze the numbers. And I said, if I can treat each acre like an apartment unit, if I can treat each acre as its own income producing, tract of land, I said, when I started looking at the cap rates and I started looking at the returns on it, I was just blown away. And then our ability to do scale, I mean, one of the things we actually recently did was we bought a cattle auction. Um, and so, you know, to go along with our, our cattle um, that we're having and stuff. And so scaling, doing our economies of scale, growing, growing the different income parts of our farms has been, uh, it's been the most profitable thing I've ever done in real estate, which is interesting because I've been in real estate, you know, in one way, shape or form my whole adult life. And I never planned on getting into farms. Um, and then, and then, as we got into farms, and we realized the profitability, and we started to build our teams and our and our agriculture teams around them, um, we started realizing we could revitalize land. We could increase irrigation. You know what used to take many, many people, um, and we used to take a whole bunch of effort and use way too much water. We can now control our irrigation on our farms on an app. Um, use less manpower and use a whole lot less water in order to do the best irrigation proper properly and also take land that was not not farmed at all and reclaim it right i think soil is one of our great american resources here in our country and so for us we decided hey um we go all in on this and we opened up you know rad american it's been the most popular investment vehicle and most popular returns we've ever had for our investors nice um now this income producing from farms how does this play a role in the, the modern agriculture so let's get down to the nuts and bolts of it and say hey um, you said you manage about a real estate portfolio, about 200 million, correct? Right. So do you, let's say if a client comes in or a partner and they say, Hey, I want to get into, you know, um, uh, you know, income producing from farms. Do you go out and do you acquire the farm? How does that work? Do you partner with the farm or do you do it yourself? Yeah. And so it just depends on the individual farm. So there's a lot of different things that happen in farming. So one of them is people will lease farms. And so. Um, for us, we don't like leasing out our farms. And the reason we don't like it is because the maximum income potential for them is not usually reached or, or, or utilized. And so we found managing operating them ourselves is the way, best way to maximize income. Now, if an investor comes to me and he says, hey, Dutch, I want to invest in the farms. How are we a tool or a continent? I think there's one of two ways. One, we have our two investment vehicles that people could invest into. One is Rad Diversified, which is our public REIT, uh, non-trader REIT, which has been around since 2019 started at $10 a share and the current share price is $2,504. Um, and then we have Rad America, which is exclusively our land and farmland REIT, um, which somebody could in invest into. And that's currently opened uh, in this year, January of this year, and it's still at $10 a share, but we've raised $6 million in capital. We've bought um, just under $20 million in total real estate uh, since, opening, since opening that fund. And so, you know, we're super excited about the future of it. And then the other 
ways, you know, sometimes we have institutions or we have family offices or high net worth investors who come in and say, hey, Dutch, I don't want to invest in a fund. That's my, not my vehicle. I'd like to joint venture with you guys. I'd like to be a 50% owner or a 20% owner in a, in a farm. And so we've been able to do some different um, joint ventures with, with farms as well. And so that's worked out pretty real effectively for us too. Okay. So let me get this straight. So you guys have a publicly traded REIT, Real Estate Investment Trust. I got that correct? Public non-traded. Oh, non-traded. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, on the other side, you said that you go out, you purchase farmland, and then you lease the farmland for income, or you just like produce off of the crops yourself for the income, the cash flow. So the easy way, the lazy way would be to just lease it, just have someone else manage it and operate it. And there are people that I call, there's like, there's operators, what I call a true operator, and there's babysitters, right? And so a babysitter is someone who has money, they're going to throw money into a piece of real estate and just use a property manager, and they're just going to utilize the income on it, which is great. Us at RAD, we're, we're a true operator, right? We get our hands in the soil, we get our hands dirty, and we run and operate it ourselves. Our, our Weezer Idaho farm, the year before we purchased it, had a lease on it for $40,000 a year in income. 18 months later, we produced seven figures, a million dollars in total revenue on the property in, in the second full full year of business. And so how we operate is very- there. So Make sure I got that right. So the $40,000 you're saying, hey, somebody was just leasing out their farm just for, hey, this is my farmland, lease it out for 40,000. So you're saying Rad came in and said, hey, I guess you started producing crops. Is it livestock? What, what did you do there to generate that seven figures? Yeah, so we looked at the Ukraine-Russia crisis, and Ukraine was the largest producer of wheat in the world, right? And so I said, hey, I said to our farm team, I said, can we produce wheat? We've produced corn, we've done soybeans, we've done other things. I said, is wheat something we can plant? And they said, yeah, and actually on all of our upper acres, it used to be winter wheat. And one of the things they had done is, so there's, there's government, I want to say the term is QRP, I could be wrong, but basically if, if we let a part of our farm not be farmed, the government for agricultural, for conservation reasons, will give us a monthly payment, a monthly allowance per acre. What that had done on that farm is it had expired. And so they were no longer receiving the monthly income, but they never began farming, right? A whole lot of the farm. So the, so the didn't was giving us, make sure I got you there, Dutch. I didn't mean to cut you off there, but. That's okay. We have a little lag. I just want to make sure I'm tracking you all the way. So you said that the government incentivized you to produce that, to produce the, uh, the agriculture or the produce that you was making from the land. I got that correct? Uh, that was, that, that is correct. That's a pretty common thing in farming. Nice. Nice. Okay. Then you, you, I'm learning something new here. So you get, you, so you get a, is it a tax break or is it a monthly sniping? You know, how does the government incentivize you to farm? It's a specific land? dollar per acre. So they give you a certain amount of money per acre. And so wow. it's not, it's not, it's not a tax break. It's a specific dollar amount per acre. And I, my team can look up the, the specific definitary term and they'll tell me in just a minute, but you know, it's interesting because it's common in farming where like farmers are notorious for saying I'm broke and I'm poor. Right. And but they have a, you know, a multi hundred thousand dollar John Deere tractor and their truck paid off and their land and their farm is paid off. Right. But the kids have grown up generationally thinking, hey, my family's not poor. Right. My family's been tight. And so lots of times family are thinking about how they want to pass the farm down generationally. But then their children aren't in a place where they want it. They want the farm, right? They haven't grown up in a place. And, and yeah, you do have generational farmers where that, that is awesome. But a lot of the farms we've bought are, 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 are parents, our families, where they just wanted the farm to continue to, to exist and flourish. And they wanted to pass it down generationally. But for whatever their family situation is, it didn't happen. And so, you know, we're able to go into these farms and really make them what they were always supposed to be. And lots of times, what's different about us, I guess, than a traditional farmer is a traditional farmer is leaving season to season, crop by crop. But at RAD, we can sit here and say, hey, what's the long-term best practice for this farm? You know, for me to put, put money into the equipment, for put money into the irrigation, put money into the soil, it's just good long-term business investing. And everything for us is never about the dip or about the bad season. Everything for us is about what is the proper income what is the proper play for this property long term and what's going to be the best thing for our land and soil and so i found over the years that that this is how we've been maximizing returns and getting just a higher yield but inflation has helped too in in this sense right hyperinflation commodities the price going up right at one point in time and I, and I couldn't tell you the price price of hay in this moment i'd have to look it up but at one point in time hay went from 160 you know dollars a ton to 300 it over doubled right 2x 
um, and, and the price per ton. And so that makes a huge difference when you're, when you're farming and, and, and like you can literally double what you were selling a crop for, you know, just 12 months before. And so for us, I, I took a look at those, those commodities and said, which commodities do I know are going to grow in value, but then also make sense for us to plant and farm on, on our crops. Okay. So now when you go in, you find, and I've, and I've known people like that personally, where their grandfather was a farmer, grandfather, you know, farmed the land. And when it gets down to the grandchildren, the grandchildren go off to college or the kids go off to college and they, nobody's interested in the land. So the land is kind of sitting there. So you say, you're saying that you go in, you purchase the land. Do you bring in your own farmers or do you train the people to be farmers? How, how does that work? Yeah, it's a great question. So on some farms, there's existing uh, team in place. There are people who are currently farming. And essentially what we do is we come in and we make their lives easier, right? We, we give them a little bit better technology. We give them a little bit more resources. And lots of times they have all the ideas already in their head on how to improve and make the farm more profitable. But, but the most common thing is, is we take a team into our Weezer, Idaho farm and we do training. And so they'll come and live on premises and they'll develop and they'll train and they'll do best practices. And so that makes a big difference. So our farm team will go in initially and, and then they're going to do whatever construction needs to be done, whatever equipment needs to be done in place. And so there's an intense first season, right? And I go seasons, it's like, you know, winter, spring, summer, fall, right? So whatever the season we buy the property and there's usually a pretty intense first season where we're doing some really hard work. And then it's always the second summer where you're maximizing profitability. Kind of that first, that first season of, of farming that you go through it, whatever the farm was before is pretty much what it's going to have to be during, during the first season. But then that second season is when we've seen the returns really yield, yield profits and, and make a big difference in the, the ROI. Okay. So you go in, you grab some farmers and you say, Hey, um, if you don't have a team involved, we're going to make your life easier. Uh, you send them out to Idaho, get them trained up. Now, what about that back end of the farm of like, once the produce is produced, um, how do you find out who to sell it to? Or who's your target audience? Is, is that already built in? What do you do on that end? Yeah, there's markets, right? Just like you would have a marketplace, like a normal person, if they wanted to go buy lettuce, right? They can go buy lettuce at a Whole Foods or a Sprouts or whatever other brand is out there. For us, there's markets and there's buyers. And so there's professional buyers that we have relationships with. And if you do you know, enough research and enough homework, what you do is you get the professional buyers that are used to buying specific commodities in your area and you build a relationship with them. And as you build a relationship with them, you can kind of start to begin to be in a place where you understand what is your price, you know, per ton that you're going to get or price per yield that you're going to get, you know, for, for the commodity that you're selling. But at the same time, right, Rad, we're always about economy of scale. It's what I've always, you know, believed is, is, is a huge part of our business. And so for us, even being integrated with the cattle auction butcher shop with our cattle makes a big difference. And so for us, like cattle, you know, typically you could go buy a cattle for $1,200, right, for, for a fully grown male cattle, pretty, pr pretty normal, right, that, that we would sell. Um, I'm not using, by the way, I'm using layman's terms, right, for the farmers who are, are going to judge me for not saying heifer or steer or one of the other things that are out there, right? So, um, but then we, we take it to the butcher shop, and, and, and if we butcher the cow ourselves, we can get as much as $1,800, right, uh, per cow. And so you take the $1,200 plus the $1,800, you're actually at $3,000. And so we decided to go ahead and start building our own butcher shop. Um, and then we realized there was a cattle auction for sale, so we went ahead uh, and purchased a cattle auction. So scaling is a big important part of it, and you can integrate. And, and we're very small, right? We're not Kroger, who's a multi, you know, the billion-dollar companies that are out there, right, and different things. We're just, you know, we're an investment company that believes in our country, believes in our, our soil, and believes in Americans investing in Americans. And if we can provide a great product for people, um, what, what's better? So now, so I'm a truck driver, a school teacher. I'm driving down the road. I'm listening to this podcast. I'm watching you live. I'm like, wow, income producing for farms. I never heard of it. I never thought about that. I knew what a farm was. That makes perfect sense. How do I get started? What do you say to that person? Well, I say my book, Money Shackles, right? And I'm not, I know I'm not trying to overdo promotions here. If anybody wants to go get a you know copy of our book, go get it. Um, the reggae industry began in 2012. It's Money that. Shackles, right? Money Shackles is your book? Yeah, money shackles. Money and, shackles. We could, put, if we could put that up in Hawaii, uh, the cover of his book, you know, money yeah. shackles. That'd be great for the fans and, and the audience to see and the listeners to, you know, be able to catch why you're speaking to. So go ahead, Dutch. I mean to cut you out there. Oh, you're great, man. I, I just got so passionate about uh, the financial system in America is there's a part of it that's broken, right? And it's people's understanding of how money works. 
And so the sh shackles is all about people breaking free from, from financial bondage, right? I believe the difference, you know, between the understanding of what money is and not understanding what money is, is huge. And, you know, people, Americans are taught, go to school, get in debt, go to college, get in debt, buy a house, get in debt, use your credit cards, get in debt. And reality is, is debt can work as a useful tool for you, right? Investing can work as a useful tool. So in the book, we talk about the reggae industry in 2012, and, and Americans have the ability to be a fractionalized owner, right, in different investment vehicles. They can be a, a fractionalized owner in a farm or a luxury property on the beach. They can be a fractionalized owner in a business, right? It's the first time that a, that a non-accredited investor, right, um, and I, I hate the difference between non-accredited and accredited. I think it's economic yeah. discrimination personally. So, but the, the, the yeah, first I time I percent once I learned what an accredited investor was, it's like, well, this is created because if you don't make this type of money, you may not understand what the economics are. I'm like, no, let, you know, laissez faire, keep your hands off of it. People figure out if you make a sophisticated investment and you didn't understand what you were doing, what's the difference between me going to a casino? I don't know what a straight line bet is and I bet my money and I lose it. Nobody's going to come back and uh, give my money back. So why not let me make an opportunity that could change my life? So I'm right there with you on that 110%. Never understood it, never got it, but you know, go ahead. I'm sorry about that. No, you're right, man, because it's clear there's a difference in opportunity, right? The wealthy have had the access to finances that the non-wealthy have not access, had access to, right? And for someone else to determine, you know, what an America can do is unconstitutional, right? We all have the equal right to pursue happiness, right? That, that is one of the core values in our country, it's one of the core beliefs, and and to take take an accredited versus non accredited is 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 an like to me you can be as hard as you want on the companies that are allowed to take investment capital, and and they should have to all play on the same footing. But to take an average American and say you don't have the same equal play and footing as others is is frustrating. So for me, Money Shackles was all about showing Americans that from 2012 and on. There, there is a, a new path, a new way that passed. There's an industry that did not exist that is now um, is in the billions, right? And I think it'll be the greatest, for me, I think it'll be the greatest alternative to Wall Street that's ever existed. I think for an average American, there has never been a true alternative to Wall Street. And I think the reggae industry creates that from crowdfunding. It creates it from the ability to invest in real estate in a way that they never had before with fractionalized ownership. And so and, I think and, it's incredibly you powerful. Oh, Investors reg, oh, you said reggae, reggae, gotcha. Reggae. Reggae, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was thinking reggae. I'm like, reggae is blowing up. I can I gotta listen to this. I mean, it some good music. <laughs> okay. So got it. So you're saying uh the reggae is allowing everyday people to get into these crowdfunding access. So a person is saying, Hey, I'm listening to you, Dutch. I like what you're saying. I like Rad. The um the website was put up there. We went through the site, we like what you're doing. How do I get started with this? How do I how do I get into this? You know, I want to diversify. I already have a bunch of stocks. I own my own home. I have some equity in my home. I would love to get into a farm. What would be your entry point? I mean, if it's directly with Rad itself, right, you absolutely can go um, to one of our websites. You fill out a form. Um, one of our team will talk to you, um, have a conversation. Because of how the industry works, they're not allowed to sell. They can just provide information is all they can do. Do your due diligence. Take your time. Know who we are, right? Um, you know, we have third-party audits, third-party evaluators of every asset we have. We are completely transparent with every asset. You literally will see addresses. You can drive by the street and you would know that Rad owns it. You can pull title, know that Rad owns it. I, I think one of the reasons I went through the regulation, a, uh, regulation in the beginning, Prince, was because I wanted investors to feel comfortable and feel that, like, hey, we're doing everything we can do um, to be compliant. We're doing everything we can do to make sure that they know what's going on. Like, you look at the old... Like you look at Madoff and you look at some of the other stuff, right? There, he wasn't a public company. He was, he was private. He didn't have the reporting. There was, there was not a, a set of assets that he owned that you can verify and, and, and you can check, right? And, and reality is, is we shouldn't allow those things to exist, I believe, right? I don't think our government should allow those things to exist. I think if you're taking in people's capital and money, you absolutely should have to be transparent, open, and real about everything that you're doing. Um, for me, even traders, they should have to have open screens and open books. And but that's my that's my own, you know, my own agenda of, of what I believe. And Americans should all have access. Growing up poor, I knew I didn't have the same opportunities with others. And you know, there are certain things I couldn't even understand growing up. I didn't understand why, you know, one person could get a scholarship and another person couldn't. I didn't understand why, you know, if you looked at the wealthier schools, well, you know, they had, you know, t you know, a hundred, you know, scholarships that went to their seniors. And in my school, there was like two, 
right, that, that went to seniors. And so, you know, some of those things, I think it's just in my DNA to create more of that equality. Um, it, it's important to me as a person, and, and I strive to do that through RAD. One of the things we did is we started uh, RAD Foundation Scholarship. So actually everybody who invests with us, um, their kids become eligible, you know, for, for our scholarship programs. And it's something we just did for all of our employees and, and, and investors. We gave out 14 last year. Uh, this year, I want to give out a whole bunch more than that. It's just a big part of my passion. Okay. So do you have a minimum investment? Do you have to have a minimum? You know, you have to be you know, a quarter million, 5,000, 500. What do you got to have to, you know, even think about getting into the space? Yeah. So, you know, through our, our regulation A, um, we were a thousand dollar minimum investment through our regulation D we're a $10,000 minimum investment. Um, we are currently, if we've, we've applied for a regulation A with our rad America, we had the regulation A with rad diversified. Um, and then there's a, it's called a regulation D. Um, and so the minimum for that is our 10,000. And so, um, just jump on the phone with our team. They'll help you figure out, you know, where you can invest with us, where you cannot invest with us and those kind of things. There's a lot of regulations and compliance and and so you know we'll we'll provide you all those disclosures and things are on the website you got to read the offering circulars um i'm always very careful on the on this line just because i i don't i'm not elon musk so i can't tell the sec i'm going to say whatever i want to say i know um, right. i want to respect and, and listen to them and and that part of it and so it's it's very very important and though we are a good sized company and we've been around a long time um we're we're we're, we're not we're not the richest man in the world so okay now i gotta answer this question where Someone, uh, you know, someone is looking at it. They're saying, hey, so what are those returns? What are those annualized returns on this income producing farm? Farm, you know, what's, what's the average? I know you can't predict the future or say, hey, this is what you're going to make. You no know, guarantees there. But, you know, what is the, you know, what, what has been some, you know, compared to the S&P 500? How has it done? Yeah, I mean, I've kicked the S&P 500s. Um, I read your thing. I'll be careful. I kicked their butt, right? Um, and, and the reason, you know, I, I I, we started at ten dollars a share, uh, 2019, and Rad Diversified. We're currently at 25.504 a share, and so you know our share price has grown um, over over those years. Our investors, you know, are, every six months they can do what's called a cash redemption, and they can re redeem stock with us, and we purchase that back ourselves versus uh, trading on the open market. Because I I didn't want what Elon or what Biden or Trump or what someone else says to change my stock price. I wanted our stock price to be based on net asset value, be based on investment income, be based on, on exactly what we're doing every single day. And so um, Rad America um, has not had its first stock price change yet. Um, it's at $10, $10 a share currently, and it'll have its stock prices, you know, change accordingly based on our net asset value. Um, what I, here's what I say. I can never predict the future. And I actually think any real estate vehicle that says, here's what your IRR is, here's what your return on investment is, here's what your future value is, I think they're full of crap. So um, if they're full of crap, it means that like they can't predict what the cost of materials, what wood, what cement, what steel, what wiring, what all that's going to cost. They can't predict what the cost of labor is going to be in the future, especially not in a hyperinflationary world. Um, they can't predict those things. So I think they're full of crap. Here's what I would say. The reason people say, well, how did Rad get such good returns? I said, I can't understand why other REITs aren't getting better returns. When you take a look at, it, at, at an asset and you say, here's what the leverage we use on, here's how much money we put in, here's how much income it produced, here's how much equity it produced, the math makes good sense to me. I think what you see them not do is you don't see them buy under market, off market, non market properties. I, I don't think you see them buy value add, uh, increased you know, value, value assets and properties. And I think they're not, also not doing, you know, there's, there's a science to real estate, right? Location, location, location it is true. But what does that actually mean, right? Do you understand what the, the landmarks are and, and, and how the, the, the price variation comes off of a landmark based on the valley? I call it the valley and the desert. One side of every landmark is going to have higher values. The other side is going to have lower values, right? The other side of the railroad tracks is a very true statement, and it's very true, right? Based on the, 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 the school systems, based on the crime rates, and based on how things are, are lined up, it's going to determine, right, the, the future values of properties and how much they appreciate. And in different economies and markets, certain locations, certain types of value assets are going to appreciate more than other economies. Like right now, assets that were luxury, actually 12 months ago, luxury assets were going to appreciate incredibly fast. During hyperinflation, they were going to grow in value incredibly fast. Right now, income producing properties are going to grow faster in value. Why? Because rents are going up. Anytime interest rates go up, mortgage rates go up, which causes rents to go up. As long as the mortgage, the value of an average mortgage continues to go up, 
landlords will continue to inch the rents up right on under, right underneath that. If people don't think like I believe in the I believe in deep state, I believe that the markets move when when they make they make it move, right? And if you don't know how to take advantage of that and you don't know how to read it and see it, then you're not paying attention. So, you know, the, the they I, want I want you to say that again. Their what, properties become worth more money. I want you to say this again, Dutch. That was a very good point you made there. Been a real estate guy. How can you take advantage of rising rates? I mean, interest rates are gonna go up. And so for me, as a landlord, you're going to raise your rents accordingly with that, right? And I, I'm not doing this from, 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 from a greed standpoint. It's the fact that this is what the market determines. This is what the market control is, right? Um, and so as rents go up, you produce more income. As you produce more income, your property becomes more valuable. And so income-producing properties are going to be more valuable during high interest rates than brand new homes. Um, and and so, so it's just difference in how the game is played. As, as the cost of a mortgage continues to go up, fewer and fewer home buyers and fewer and fewer people want to move. People are going to be more forced to move, like if they have to move because of jobs or they have to move because of relocation than because they want to move. When it's lower interest rates, people move because they want to. They move because they can get another property and a location that they desire. They move because they can get a lower interest rate maybe than, than they previously had. Right now, people are moving because they either haven't owned before and so now it's time for them to own. They've gotten to that financial place, that, that time in life where people move because they have to, because of life circumstances. Okay. Now, um, I want to say this for everybody that's out there. If you're catching this live or the playback, the first two people that I see comment the words Dutch, you're going to get a free copy of his book, Money Shackles. So you copy Dutch if you're catching this live or when you catch the playback, you know, um, hit the word, you know, comment the word Dutch. And I will reach out to you, get your information, and I would get a copy of his book out to you guys, you know, courtesy of myself, Prince Dykes. Now, before we get out of here, Dutch, what do you want to say? What do you got to say to everybody? How can people follow you? How can people get more of you? Um, things like that. What do you want to leave the, the audience with? I mean, follow. I mean, we're on every platform, right? Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, TikTok, right? Instagram, all, all of those things. If you want to follow, be a part of our tribe, right? We're, we're going to be there to serve you. We're going to be there to take care of you. We're very pro-American um, company we believe in and, and our warriors. I say, if you don't like our, our warriors that have made, made us free in this country, then don't invest with us. Don't buy our book. Um, I, 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 I think I've had a great freedom to build an empire and, and wealth. And, and the more paths, the more avenues that I can open that up to everyday people, to, to the professionals, to people working their ass off here, here in this country to be successful. Um, I'm going to continue to do that. And that's my mission in life. So Prince, man, I Great gratitude. You're, you're spreading the message, and I appreciate that. Thank you. And also, I just retired from the Navy 20 years. So, yeah, I'm one of those warriors you were talking about there, too. So, definitely. Well, people got your information. Follow, you know, follow more. Ask some questions. This has you know, been a wealth of knowledge. We're talking about income producing, you know, what to do. Everybody look at everybody look at rising interest rates is the end of the world. And, Oh my God, the world's coming to an end. It's like, hey, there are ways to take advantage of how rising interest rates too. So, with that being said, Dutch, anything else before we roll out? If the world's coming to an end, you you, you definitely want to have your money in the right places, right? And and that's the thing is like, the the, the people that that, that are, are controlling the greater things that are beyond your reach and my reach, Prince, right? Um, they don't want the world to end, right? But they do want control of it, and I, I believe in that every American's freedom to control their own money. Um, to control their own financial future and destiny. And, and uh, I look forward to being a part of that journey with those of you who see this and, and uh, appreciate you, Prince, very much. Appreciate your service, brother. Um, I can't have more gratitude. I, I've been free my whole life and I'm pretty lucky to have that freedom. Definitely. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's going to conclude today's show, today's episode that you got. You have Dutch Mendenhall from Rad Diversified talking about income producing farms and also real estate in himself don't forget to drop dutch below in the comments to get your free copy of his book money shackles hope you guys and girls got something out of it and to the next video podcast cartoon or whatever it is crazy whatever 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 crazy you see me doing around this globe peace be safe i'm out and thank you